So um, today, I'm going to tell you about AI and deep learning and some of the reasons why this is really having a big impact in, in the world. Um, to get started, let me tell you about why I got into this field and um, why I think it could have even more impact. So really, it has to do with a hypothesis about intelligence. Um, there, this is a hypothesis. We don't really know if this is true or not. But, but essentially, there are people who believe that uh, intelligence could be explained uh, through very simple theories, where there are others who think that in order to build intelligent machines or understand our brains, we just uh, have to consider a huge bag of tricks, uh, all of the knowledge that is required to make uh, uh, being intelligent. So the hypothesis that I uh, favor and that it seems to be validated by the, the work we've done in the last few years is that there exist a few simple principles like the laws of physics which would explain our intelligence and of course allow us to build intelligent machines. So this is, um, this is important because um, there, there are many different ways but could consider how to build intelligent machines. And uh, it's, it's all about uh, knowledge. So uh, the idea of machine learning is that we're going to get the knowledge into the computer by uh, allowing the computer to experience a lot of examples, a lot of data, and potentially to interact with this environment. Um, there, there are, of course, other approaches to uh, AI, but machine learning has been incredibly successful. And uh, within uh, machine learning, there is a set of approaches called deep learning, which follow up on decades of research on neural networks. And this is what I'm going to tell you about. And this is also what has really pushed the, the, the boundary of AI in the last few years. So the breakthroughs in AI, uh, thanks to deep learning, have been mostly in the uh, abilities of computers to perceive the world. So uh, maybe uh, best uh, looked at in the context of images and the ability of computers to interpret images, to recognize objects in images, or even like in the example um, on the left, um, to convert an image into a sentence. This is a work, something we did in 2014. Um, there's, of course, been progress also in using these kinds of techniques to provide a sort of um, intuitive understanding of the kind that is important to play some games, like the game of Go, which had defeated uh, previous attempts of classical AI based on search, uh, because the number of possible uh, 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 positions, uh, configurations to uh, look at because of the branching factor of the game was just too large for a search method to be successful. But, but these techniques, a little bit like humans, instead of searching through billions of configurations, they, 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 they learn uh, something that's more like a player's intuition about you know, what is good and what is bad and can quick, quickly evaluate uh, a, a position without having to consider lots of them. Actually, the first breakthrough in the applications of deep learning came around 2010, 2012 in speech recognition. Um, so what you see in the figure are years and uh, roughly the performance of speech recognition systems on a benchmark uh, lower is better, so this is error rates, and really there's been this knee um, around these years which has quickly shifted the whole field of speech recognition uh, from classical methods based on hidden Markov models to neural nets. Um, and then a similar thing happened with computer vision from 2012 to 2014, roughly speaking, and it's due to a particular kind of neural net called a convolutional neural net which is uh, really well suited for dealing with images and in which the input, uh, well, like all of the deep learning, is processed in stages, but each of these stages is uh, a, a, a doing a kind of computation uh, similar to a convolution with some nonlinearity. Um, and the advantage of this particular kind of neural net architecture is that it makes those neural nets really well suited to data in which uh, the input could be translated, like images you can translate or uh, rotate them, and the output should be roughly the same or just translated in the same way. Furthermore, these architectures incorporate ideas of multiple 
scales here, multiple spatial scales, but we can uh, also think of multiple temporal scales. Now, um, um, since the early days of uh, deep learning, one of the big ideas that really uh, allowed us to make progress is the notion of learning representations, of learning uh, higher level abstractions within those representations. So in classical AI, humans, uh, engineers, define the, the, the concepts and, and the abstractions that we want machines to manipulate. But what is going on here is that uh, with, with these machine learning techniques, uh, a lot of the features and, and, and uh, concepts that the machine is manipulating are actually learned. Um, this, is, this is difficult, and I think we are still far from having achieved the goals that we set ourselves uh, more than 10 years ago. And what we wanted was uh, for machines to be able to transform the data into a new space, a new set of features in which the different factors that explain the data, the different causal factors ideally, could be separated, could be disentangled from each other. Whereas if you look at an image, um, all of the important information is, is entangled through the pixels. Like there's no single pixel that gives you an answer to an interesting question. Uh, you have to really combine information from all of the pixels. Whereas at, at these higher levels, it should be very easy to answer in almost any kind of uh, question that humans care about. And uh, one of the areas of applications of um, uh, convolutional nets and, and deep learning for images that I've worked on and I think is quite interesting uh, for society is uh, medical images. Um, this is maybe the area of applications of deep learning to medicine where the progress has been most striking in the last couple of years. Um, to the point that we now have systems where um, the uh, classifications that are uh, produced by the deep learning uh, neural net are better than those of the best doctors and, and much better than the average doctor. Um, for example, we're working with this company in Montreal called Imagia, which is commercializing this type of system with uh, Olympus uh, to detect uh, cancer cells in your intestine and polyps. Something else has changed in recent years. Um, you know, in the old days, people thought of neural nets as machines that could uh, do pattern recognition, take an image or a sound, and then perform a classification. So go from sensory data to some uh, classifications or high level predictions or probabilities. But in recent years, we have turned this upside down. So now we have systems <coughs> that can uh, generate images that can synthesize <coughs> new images uh, and imagine new images. So what you're seeing here actually are not uh, real images. They were imagined by a computer that was trained on lots and lots of images of faces. So the computer was only seeing lots and lots of faces and it figured out how a face typically looks like and, and all kinds of variations of faces that exist. Um, and, and, and creating new combinations of the attributes that define our face uh, that have never seen before. And what you see on the top is the progression of the research on these methods called generative adversarial networks, or GANs, which we introduced in my lab uh, um, again around 2014. Um, and so, so this is interesting. Uh, and uh, various uh, forms of this are uh, now being used for all kinds of image processing applications. Uh, but of course, there's also uh, potentially misuse of this kind of technology. You can think of um, uh, creating, uh, people are starting to create videos uh, that, uh, in which they can control what the persons are saying or doing. Uh, and once those videos look really realistic, you can imagine how you, know, you could use this to influence people, to create fake news and so on. So there's, there's, uh, there's concerns as well. Um, another area where uh, machine learning and deep learning in particular is making a lot of progress recently, but it's just beginning, is the area of robotics. Uh, for many years, robots were programmed using all kinds of uh, uh, handcrafted uh, knowledge about the physics and, and the control. And in recent years, we're starting to see uh, systems that are trained more end-to-end -end with these neural nets that can also take advantage of vision. So that one of the things that was really missing in 
robotics was the ability of these robots to uh, make sense of, of uh, the visual world. Um, that now makes it possible for these uh, robots to do things like pick objects from a large set of objects, uh, even though it, you know, it's cluttered and never exactly in the same way, so they could be much more adaptive. Another change that has happened in recent years uh, compared to the classical neural nets, as I said, there were like pattern recognition machines that can take a vector, a fixed size set of numbers and produce some, some answers. Um, the, the change is that we now have neural nets that can handle all kinds of data structures. And this is thanks to uh, an innov innovation we introduced uh, a few years ago um, called soft attention, which allows the neural nets to sequentially process information and at each step focus the computation on just a few elements that matter for the next step of computation, just like you and I do when we use our attention to focus on just a few things, a few aspects of, of the world that the, is currently relevant to our uh, cognition, uh, which is actually what we have in our thoughts, right? Um, so the context in which we introduce this is that of uh, machine translation. And um, uh, in machine translation, the notion of attention becomes really useful when you consider um, um, the situation where you're gonna produce sequentially one word at a time, the next word in the translated sen sentence. Um, and um, when you're producing the next word at some position in, in, in the output se sentence, um, you really wanna focus on one or a couple of words in the source sentence, which contain the most information about uh, what the, the next word uh, should be in the translated sentence, right? So this notion of attention in this case turns out to be really important and it has really allowed a breakthrough in machine translation. Uh, since 2016, Google has put that in their Google Translate system and um, they've measured how much of an improvement they were obtaining compared to the classical systems based on n-grams. Uh, and the, the jump is pretty phenomenal. We're not yet at human level translation, but we have approached that level uh, by, you know, more than, than uh, dividing by half, say, the, the, um, the quality uh, gap that remains. So, so this is all great. Um, let me try to tell you a little bit more about um, what are the ingredients of this success. Um, and in general, the ingredients, I believe, for machine learning trying to tackle really difficult AI kinds of problems. So, so I put five ingredients here. So number one is lots and lots of data. So why, why is it that we need so much data? Well, in order to build a system that has some intelligence, um, it needs knowledge. And as I said at the beginning, uh, there are different ways we can put knowledge in the computer. But uh, what has been really successful is for the computer to acquire that knowledge by itself. And if we wanna have a lot of knowledge about something, then we're gonna need a lot of data to provide implicitly that information, right? So the more complex the task you wanna learn, the more data is needed for the knowledge to be compiled uh, through learning into those, those systems. The other thing, uh, number two, that we need is that um, because we don't know ahead of time what the right form of the solution to our problems will be, um, we need the, the systems that are gonna uh, suck in all that knowledge to be sufficiently flexible, that they can represent a very rich set of possible solutions, uh, not limited, say, to linear predictors, and, um, and, and that we, can't, we don't need to specify ahead of time um, the, the sort of function that needs to be computed, but, but be in a way, uh, if you think about statistics, non-parametric. Um, so the more data we have, the more flexible uh, the solutions can be. The third thing we need, which goes with both of these things, is we need enough computing power. One of the reasons why deep learning really uh, um, advanced in the last few years is because around 2009, we started using GPUs for neural nets. Um, and I think even now, we are very limited in our abilities to build smarter machines and better models by the existing computing power. The good news is that lots of companies like uh, Intel and Google and, and others 
are building specialized chips for neural nets, which means that in the next few years, we're gonna multiply our computing power by you know, 10 or 100 or something like that. Um, another point that is maybe uh, more specialized technically with machine learning is that um, it's not enough to have knowledge. You need to, build, you need to be able to use it uh, in a computationally efficient way, right? So if you think about, uh, for example, a lot of classical AI methods based on search, like the example I gave you earlier with the game of Go, the computer um, may have a lot of knowledge uh, uh, at its disposal, but it, it has to do, for each question you ask, like what should I play, it has to do a lot of computation in order to answer the question. Um, and, and, and we care mostly about how uh, you know, this computation scales. Um, what's interesting with neural nets is that although training them can be long, um, once they're trained, you can use them for what we call inference very, very quickly. And so in fact, since 2012, I think the speech there is a speech recognition uh, system uh, based on neural nets on, on Android phones in your phone already. Uh, of course, there are lots of challenges to, um, to, to, to put bigger models on your phones, but, but companies are working hard on that. And finally, the number five is maybe the, the, the most subtle point and uh, also the most important. Um, it's not enough to have all of these four things uh, that I mentioned. You also need your uh, machine learning systems to generalize well, to perform well on new examples. And that is not a given. Um, there are many different ways that you can uh, uh, train a machine and somehow uh, each of them incorporates different sort of assumptions about the world, different what we call priors, and, uh, and some really work better on particular problems and, 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 and that's something that we care about depending on the problems we wanna solve, but, but in AI, we care about the kinds of problems that humans are good at. Um, so it turns out that uh, deep networks are incorporating a sort of assumption about the world which is, uh, um, uh, exploited also by humans and that you, you find also in the way that humans, uh, for example, design systems and the way that humans manipulate language. And it's the assumption of compositionality, which is something that should be very familiar to computer scientists, that we can build systems by combining pieces together, that we can describe the world by combining pieces together. So um, this combinatorial aspect um, is very important and um, in neural nets you get it in two ways. You get it at each layer of the neural net. Uh, each layer has many units and um, each of those units is gonna be trained and it's going to learn a, to represent a different aspect of the data. And uh, if you think of them, say, to, to make things simple as binary units, then um, it's like you have all of these binary features and the number of combinations of those bits of course, grows exponentially. So the richness of what can be represented is very large. And then there's another kind of uh, combinatorics kicking in when you have depth. So when you have many layers, one on top of the other, so that's like in, in this picture, um, that often the way that we uh, solve problems is through a pipeline of computations where each level is taking the output of the previous level as input and then um, uh, doing something like a mathematical composition of function where the you know, output of a function is the input of the next function. Um, and, uh, and of course, when we program, we do that all the time. Uh, it's a very important property of, of, of programs that we have this sort of compositionality um, with functions and you know, procedures and sub-procedures and so on. So, so the depth of neural nets really implement that kind of idea and we, we now have uh, math and theory that helps us actually understand that these properties are crucial to their um, generalization ability, that they really give a big advantage in theory to, to learn um, some functions, and not necessarily all functions, but the functions that have these sort of uh, compositionality properties. So as I said uh, a little bit earlier, one of the key elements of uh, deep learning is the notion that um, what we're gonna be learning is not just a mapping from inputs to outputs, but it's representations. So the data is gonna be transformed gradually into different representations at different levels. And, and we'd like the uh, highest level representation 
to really uh, simplify things for us, to transform the data distribution in a way that's gonna make further processing uh, much easier. So one way to visualize this geometrically that uh, we've, uh, we've been working on for a few years is to think of um, the data distribution as a, as a set of points, like the spaghetti on the, on the, on the curve uh, in the bottom, sorry, in the bottom. Um, so, you know, think of each point here as an example, and, and this is a 2D space, but you have to think of a, a high dimensional space. Uh, like each point is, a, is an image, for example, and the set of natural images forms um, what we call a manifold. Here it's the, this curve. And it turns out that the, the kinds of uh, data that we care about, like text and images and sounds, um, uh, have their distribution concentrated near these low dimensional manifolds. But uh, the, the bad news is that those, those manifolds, those, those um, sets, are um, very complicated. They, they, they like have a lot of curvature and, and they're very difficult, difficult to characterize. So uh, one way that we can think of what those neural nets are doing is to transform the space, like stretch and, and, and compress in different places such that this, this spaghetti becomes flat. And once it's flat, it's very easy to do things with it. It's very easy to model its distribution and to relate different variables to each other. So, um, so for this, we typically think of the transformation from the raw data to the high level space as uh, something that, we, that would encode information and then uh, in, in this new representation. And then we can often in many applications want to train uh, a backwards function that tries to invert this and go back from the representation space to the data space. And so, so what those encoders do is they flatten these uh, manifolds and, and disentangle them. Um, and once you have those manifolds, you can do really cool things like interpolate between different objects in the space, like different images. Here we are interpolating between the image of a, a male and the image of a, a female. Um, and uh, there is a trajectory, a simple linear interpolation in representation space. Um, where each point can be mapped back to an image using the decoder. And so now we can see that there is a direction in this abstract space which corresponds to gender. And you could imagine maybe some directions corresponding to age and other characteristics, right? So, so we've transformed the, the, the low level space like pixels to a space that's uh, more semantic and where uh, the small changes are, are much more meaningful, corresponding to the kinds of things that humans care about. And uh, now we have these encoders and decoders, which means we can do what we call inference, in other words, map an image to uh, a point in that high level uh, space or generate new images. So the way we generate images is we just uh, randomly sample in the high level space and then map it back to images. And the way this has this been trained, all the, all the points in the high level, high level space correspond to a valid um, image, say, in, in the data space. Um, so, so up to now, I've been telling you about the good news, the things that work, and, and some of the reasons why. Um, now I'm going to focus a little bit on, uh, well, what's left and, and what next and what are the limitations of current systems. Um, the most important message here is uh, in case uh, maybe you heard otherwise, um, we're still really very far from human level AI. Um, pretty much all of the industrial success of uh, deep learning has been based on supervised learning where humans um, must provide a lot of data uh, that have been curated uh, where the humans have pro are providing labels corresponding to uh, important high-level abstractions that give very strong clues to the learner about what, uh, what matters in the data. Um, and, um, and that's one limitation because humans uh, um, are able to learn in a much richer way, much more autonomous way. Also, when we look at the kinds of mistakes that these industrial systems make, um, Clearly, we see that they don't understand the world like we do. In fact, uh, not anywhere as well as we do. 
So for example, uh, you see these adversarial examples. So on the left, it's, it's a regular image uh, of a dog and, and the neural net classifies it as a dog. But if you tweak the pixels in, in a particular way that you know, we optimize the tweaking so that instead of saying dog, it's gonna say ostrich, you get an image that looks like the, the first one. Uh, I mean, we can't visually see the difference, but the computer uh, somehow uh, sees the difference and now thinks that it's an ostrich. So clearly, you know, uh, they, they, they make mistakes and there are many other examples uh, uh, where we see that they, they use fairly superficial clues about the world in order to come up with their classifications. Um, so they, but you know, it, it's, it's not completely surprising. So if you think about lower level animals, they also do this. They, they, they try to understand the world and, and they do it in a way that is not as complete as, as our ways to understand the world. And that's why we can trap an animal, right? We can just uh, give them some bait and they don't see the big context that they're gonna be uh, eaten tomorrow morning. And so, you know, it's the same thing here. They, they, these systems don't have a level of understanding of the world as powerful as, as ours. And um, one way to uh, think about the limitations of the current approaches, um, they don't seem to have uh, as much of a common sense understanding of the world that we do. Um, and uh, where do we get that? Well, it turns out that um, within the first few years of life, children in a completely unsupervised way learn a lot of things about our world. Um, so for example, a two-year-old understands what we call intuitive physics. Now, I mean, she didn't take classes, you know, it's not like this, um, and her parents don't need to teach her about differential equations and Newton's law and so on. Um, the child just observes the world, uh, plays around, interacts with the world, and somehow builds an intuitive knowledge of physics about forces and gravity and uh, solid objects and liquid objects and, 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 and so on. Um, so, so it's one of the goals of current research is how do we build machines that can do this kind of thing, that can just observe and interact with an environment and figure out the underlying laws that, that explain it in some, maybe, maybe not in a formal way, like, like we do in a physics class, but, but in an informal, intuitive way like a child does. Um, so the good news though, in, even though we are far from human level AI, um, and we don't know how long it's gonna take to, to really approach human level AI. The good news is that the progress that's been made in the last few years in the science of machine learning and deep learning um, is, is gonna have a big impact. Even if we stop doing research tomorrow, and we're not gonna stop doing research. In fact, we're doing a lot more research because there's so much money flowing into uh, you know, both academic research and industrial research in, in machine learning. Um, and and the, reason, the reason I'm saying this is that there's a huge untapped potential of using these techniques uh, uh, over uh, many uh, domains that we haven't yet explored and also improving on the current domain simply by taking advantage of larger data sets. Uh, for example, in healthcare, there's a huge amount of untapped um, resources, uh, data isn't shared easily for all kinds of good reasons, and, but, but you know, clearly in the next few years, we're gonna have access to much larger amounts of data. And this is true in many areas um, where uh, organizations are collecting more and more data, uh, much more than they used to in the past. So this is gonna uh, change, even if we don't change any science, it's gonna change our ability to take advantage of these methods. In addition, uh, when you actually build a product using deep learning, there's a lot of engineering involved uh, to tweak those neural nets, to tr try to find the right architecture, uh, to set the hyperparameters, to, to explore different uh, training frameworks, uh, to evaluate them properly. There's a lot of work that's really engineering uh, that uh, you know, takes time. And so I think we're gonna see more and more applications as different companies uh, do that work for uh, maybe, uh, applications we're not foreseeing already or, or that are just at the beginning. Finally, as I said earlier, one of the limitations 
uh, in, in machine learning is always the hardware, like the computing power. And clearly, uh, there's gonna be improvements in hardware and in the energy efficiency of these systems and um, the speed of these systems, the memory that is gonna be available for those models. All of these things are very likely to improve in the next decade. So, so these three things together, I think, would already have a huge economic impact in the next few years uh, in areas just as medicine, factory automation, transportation, agriculture, molecular design, personal assistance, uh, uh, translation systems, speech recognition, synthesis, uh, and, and, and many other areas involving images, texts, uh, videos, uh, sounds, uh, all kinds of signals. Uh, uh, all kinds of databases and records and so on. So economists believe that, in fact, this is the beginning of a, a new industrial revolution uh, where machines extend um, the uh, cognitive power of humans and uh, that this is gonna touch pretty much all of the sectors of the economy. Uh, they're projecting growth uh, uh, that's pretty amazing coming from these techniques. Uh, something like 14% of the total GDP would be due to uh, AI techniques in 2030. That's lots of dollars. Uh, and and uh, uh, organizations um, like Accenture have made projections uh, per country of how much growth uh, should be expected uh, uh, if there was no uh, use of AI techniques versus uh, if, if the growth that we are foreseeing continues. Uh, and and it, you know, this is going from the red to the purple, um, which is pretty amazing. So I think for many uh, industries, um, embracing that change is not just a question of uh, competitiveness, it's a question of survival. Um, because it's not just that uh, some products will become uh, slightly more efficient, of course that will happen, but, but also completely new products will appear that we don't even dream of right now. Think about, um, say, the introduction of electricity at, uh, uh, in the last century. Uh, at the beginning, people didn't realize all of the possible uses that would uh, uh, come out. Um, now, in practical applications, I think uh, it's important to keep in mind that the AI we're talking about is different from the AI that maybe some of you remember from the 80s and 90s. Uh, um, and it's the, the, the most fundamental way in which it's different is that it depends heavily on data. Um, and so, uh, you know, companies are now really focusing on uh, their data strategy and uh, asking themselves, what kind of data do I need to collect? Um, you know, it used to be that companies were collecting data for some purpose, uh, which was not machine learning. Uh, maybe some accounting purpose or keeping track of things. Um, but nowadays, the thinking is, well, what would I need to collect so that I could have these potential applications uh, open up, all right? And it's not always just collecting data, it's also labeling it. So actually, there are some costs to not just managing it, but, but putting uh, uh, labels on the data that would, that would tell the computer what we expect the machine to do in many different cases. All right, let me say uh, a few words about Montreal's AI ecosystem. Uh, I'm the scientific director of MILA, uh, the, the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms. Um, MILA is one of three institutes that the Canadian government has created across the country, one in Montreal, one in Toronto, and one in Edmonton. And, and MILA has the greatest concentration of academic researchers in deep learning in the world. Uh, there's about 250 people right now doing research in deep learning. Um, it's, it's a rapidly growing research hub. Uh, we have pretty amazing international recognition. Uh, of course, first in the scientific community, but more and more uh, in uh, industry as well as many of the big tech companies uh, have been opening up research labs here in Montreal, including Microsoft, uh, Google, Facebook, um, uh, DeepMind, um, Samsung, and so on. Uh, and in addition to these large companies, uh, there's a very rapidly growing ecosystem 
of startups uh, with hundreds of millions of dollars already invested in AI startups in Montreal. And it's expected that this number is gonna triple in the next couple of years. So um, if you're uh, thinking about starting a company uh, that will take advantage of AI, um, you really need to uh, spend time to understand a little bit more uh, uh, what, what, you know, what is this about and um, to design a data strategy to think about talent. One of the biggest problems for companies nowadays uh, which want to take advantage of machine learning is that there are not enough people with the expertise to uh, build the systems and, and, and uh, uh, design the new products that are going to be based on machine learning. Um, and, and, and this is creating a bubble for salaries. I mean, uh, especially in California, the salaries of uh, engineers with that kind of expertise or even researchers in, with that kind of expertise are, are a bit crazy. Uh, hopefully, thanks to uh, people like me in academia, uh, the bubble is eventually going to burst and the salaries are gonna go down, but it doesn't look like this right now. Um, because the demand for these kinds of people is growing faster than our ability to train more people. Um, so we'll see you know, where the two curves meet eventually. But, but right now, the demand is, is, is crazy and it, you know, it takes years to train such people. So one of the things I often uh, tell uh, people in company is, well, you, know, it, you, can, you can train an engineer to learn enough about deep learning within about a year uh, so that they can become essentially uh, operational to use this technology, use the, the software that exists and, and, and do all kinds of useful things. So, you know, you don't need somebody with a PhD uh, for many of the uses of the technology that, that are out there. Um, so that's, that's one thing. But that means the companies have to give time to their engineers, um, their programmers, to, uh, to, to learn, to read, to uh, try to reproduce papers, uh, to go and take courses, uh, and, and potentially to interact with academia uh, in institutes like mine where we are providing um, uh, training courses and things like this uh, uh, of, of different kinds. So this is, uh, you know, this, this is an investment. It's not, uh, because it's hard to recruit those people, I mean, of course you should try to recruit those people, you should also invest in internal training. Um, for um, the last bit of my presentation, I want to tell you uh, a bit about uh, um, the concerns that I also have about AI. I mean, it's, it's great to develop this uh, technology, it, it's great to see its applications and to, to consider the economic growth that's going to uh, arise out of all these things. Um, hopefully that will be uh, beneficial and producing material progress for many people around the planet, improving healthcare, improving education, and all kinds of services, uh, such as, uh, for example, there's lots of research and legal services using uh, deep learning. Um, eventually even changing the notion of what work means, right, as machines, so we're not talking about tomorrow, but let's say in 20 years or something, as AI continues to make progress, I think the, the, our relationship to work is gonna change, um, and hopefully for the better, right? So uh, for many people in our society, currently work is a sort of slavery, I mean, something we have to do to survive, um, but for some uh, uh, happy few, uh, like myself, work is more like something we do because uh, we are really enjoying it and uh, we feel like it's making us better people and allowing us to contribute to society. Um, what I'm hoping is uh, this could be the case for many more people as the more boring jobs, um, more dangerous jobs are gonna be done by machines. Now, um, Unfortunately, there's also uh, some downsides. On, on the work side, um, of course, there's gonna be a transition. It's, you know, if uh, the previous industrial revolutions took uh, many decades or a century to really uh, um, transform society, we're talking here about, you know, 10, 20 years, so this is much faster. It's, it's less than uh, the time uh, needed for a person who started a career in some uh, particular area to complete their um, 
and, and get to pension. Uh, so um, there'll be a lot of people in the middle age who are gonna lose their job and uh, I think this could be very dangerous uh, for democracy as we are already seeing some, some of these things happening with automation. Um, and of course we want to minimize that kind of misery. So I think governments have a responsibility to think ahead of these changes and introduce um, maybe reskilling programs and changes in the social safety net. Uh, I, I'm a proponent of universal basic income, for example, but try to uh, uh, buffer those changes and, and keep society in, in good shape. Okay, so that's work for work, but there are many other issues that are popping up as the power of this technology becomes clearer. And one area where I've also been speaking quite a bit is um, military and security applications. Um, you know, I showed you these faces that the computer can, rec can recognize or can synthesize. And uh, with this kind of technology, you can track people anywhere, basically, if you have enough cameras. Uh, and, and there are now databases with uh, hundreds of millions of faces of people that computers can recognize uh, from a single uh, shot. Um, in China right now, there's um, uh, more than uh, 100 million cameras installed in the streets, and this is just the beginning. So you could see how this technology could be used to track where people are, what they're doing, and um, this could be used for good, of course, uh, but it could also be used to control uh, a population and uh, uh, make it possible for authoritarian regimes to stay in place. So basically the kind of big brother scenario uh, that was science fiction a few years ago could become reality if we're not careful about issues of privacy and, and you know, what applications we think are acceptable and what are not. And among the applications that are not acceptable for me includes these famous killer robots, which just means uh, weapons that can kill a human being um, without uh, uh, having another human being in the loop of the decision. So, you know, automatically kill people, essentially. Uh, and that's already something that military organizations are working on. And I, I don't see any scientific barrier to build these things. We have drones that already can, can kill, that have weapons installed on them. Right now, they're remote controlled. Uh, in the future, with the, the sort of uh, uh, face recognition and, and person detection technology that already exists, uh, you'll be able to use those drones to target individuals. And you could imagine uh, the whole um, uh, security balance of the planet being uh, upset by, by this type of technology. Um, so what we can do for this is uh, um, lobby our governments uh, around, uh, around the world and uh, here in Canada I've been doing it with the Canadian government so that uh, uh, different governments around the world agree on uh, international treaties similar for example to the treaties we already have for nuclear weapons and for landmines to, uh, to, to limit the kind of uses that this technology uh, can be, uh, can be um, uh, have uh, and, and avoid this sort of uh, um, uh, lethal autonomous weapons. There are also other issues like um, how the technology could be used in advertising. So when you use uh, machine learning for advertising, which is of course one of the biggest revenue source for companies like uh, Google and Facebook, um, it, it may seem a little bit innocuous, like who cares if you know, I buy Pepsi or Coke, but, but, but this could also be used in ways that go against my interest or the interest of the planet. Uh, it could be used, for example, in, in political advertising, and I think we have to be, again, uh, really careful about this uh, sort of uses. Um, another issue that people are talking about is that because those systems that we're building are trained on data that comes from human behavior very often. Uh, they tend to uh, reproduce the sort of biases and discriminations that, that, that people uh, um, have. And uh, this is something we need to be aware of and try to limit. All right, so um, I'm gonna stop here and uh, thank you for uh, your attention.